Hello Value Investors, thank you for joining me. In today's video, we're going to talk about passive income or dividends. We're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of dividend stocks and how those compare with total return by looking at the advantages and disadvantages of total return. So if you're new to the channel, please subscribe now so you can get my next video installment. Let's get started. So dividend stocks are quite attractive. The reason being that you are essentially trying to buy a mature business. This business has grown out of places to invest capital and management believes that the best return that they can do is to return capital to shareholders. So that on the surface looks great. You get a company that's a stable company that has been through many cycles and it's possibly most likely one of the leaders within its sector and it's returning capital to the shareholder. You are pretty much guaranteed that dividend irrespective of the share price. For example, if the share company is $20 a share and they're paying out $1 a share in dividends, you're getting a 5% yield. So that's great. If you look elsewhere on the market, 5% yield is pretty high. So you want to compare what you can get elsewhere. Now, the first thing is that that dividend yield comes to you pretty much guaranteed for as long as the company is earning enough that it can cover that dividend yield. But right away, you can see there are a couple of problems. On Wall Street, there is no guarantees. So it's an assumption that the business is strong enough that it can pay out that dividend. Now, for example, you look at a company like IBM and that pays you a dividend and that's great. You're probably getting around, let's say, a 4% dividend on IBM, but over time, your asset, the value of your asset has depreciated. What it means is, for all intents and purposes, if you've invested in IBM after 2013, you are most likely, including dividends, holding a loss on your investment. So that's not a great thing. You could argue with Michael, I'm getting a dividend every quarter and that dividend accumulates. Yes, you are. But the, the capital appreciation has come down over time. Hasn't been smooth, but it has come down. So yes, you are getting a 4% dividend on front of it, but your total return at the end of each year has decreased. Not only decreased in terms of inflation, not only underperformed the S&P 500 or a similar average, but your whole capital over time has depreciated. So you can look at another tech company and you can say, okay, Apple, Apple pays about probably 1% dividend and on the face of it, it's not as attractive. The yield on Apple is not as attractive, but it might be the case that Apple has more potential to keep growing. So when you look at the dividend yield of a stock, you should compare and see how much of that earning power is covered by actual free cash flow. So I've got a video on that that I, it goes in quite a, a lot of detail. And for this purpose of this video, I wanted it to be just for more for a beginner's kind of outlook. But if you look and you see that one company, the dividend gets covered quite amply. So let's say in my example, that the share price is $20, the dividend is a dollar, and the company's earning power is let's say, $2, 
is quite well covered, this dividend. On the other hand, if the dividend is, is a dollar, but the earning power is about $1.10, they're pretty much paying out that whole amount of the earnings as a dividend. Now, in my mind, if there's not enough dividend cover, that is a risk. Maybe next year, the market is not so favorable for that company, and they are not going to be able to pay out that dividend. So then they cut the dividend, and then you're in problem, because then that loses all the confidence of the shareholders. The shareholders are going to sell out, you're going to hit a lot of stop losses, and that's just going to kind of compound all the way down. So you have to consider not only the straight away how much of a dividend it has in terms of dividend yield, but you also got to compare to the earnings power. And like anything, the most important part of this whole assumption comes off the balance sheet. You look on the balance sheet and you can say, okay, um, IBM has in this case quite a lot of debt. That could cause some problems. It might not, but it could. So that's something to look at. So you could compare in this example of Apple and you look at the balance sheet of Apple and you look, wow, that's got like, you, you don't need to be an expert on a balance sheet. You can just look. Cash and subtract the dividends, uh, subtract the debt. So in the case of Apple, I'm running off the top of my mind, but it's it's probably around in the ballpark of a hundred and something, 108, 110 billion net cash. So what does that mean when someone says net cash? It means you take off all the cash, cash equivalents, short-term investments. So this is all in the current assets. So if you look on a balance sheet, you look at the current assets and you look on and the cash and short-term investments. Short-term investments is typically bonds that can be come to maturity in about three months. So just not to overcomplicate, just look at cash, short-term investments, you subtract, that means minus away the debt that comes under current liabilities and the debt that comes under long-term that uh, liabilities. Now, here's a problem that while trying to get too complicated, in the case of Apple, it's quite a, a lean business. It doesn't have a lot in terms of operating leases, but certain businesses have more operating leases. Hypothetically, you could look at, let's say, a stock that I was quite familiar with. Let's say, um, I don't have a position in this, but Bed Bath & Beyond. So that has a lot of leases attached to it and it pays a above market dividend yield. What does that mean? It means that most companies pay in a ballpark of 3 to 5% dividend yield. So if you see a company is paying substantially higher than that, you should question the company's ability to keep paying out that dividend. Because if you have something that's fairly high, it means the share price more often than not is quite low. So it means that the investors as a whole, the market as a whole, doesn't have a lot of confidence in that business. So this could imply that it's not such a good dividend stock. Now, this leads me to capital appreciation. So capital appreciation is the part of the asset that is worth more over time. This is what Buffett predominantly does. If you look at Berkshire Hathaway, it doesn't pay its shareholders any dividend. It reinvests everything it makes into new opportunities. So it grows its earning power over time. That's what made Buffett's huge returns. It just keeps snowballing that in. So there's no dividend payout. There was the vote, I can't remember the year now, 2015 or 16, where they kind of, Buffett said, okay, we're kind of struggling to find areas to redeploy our capital. Would the shareholders like a dividend? And they voted <laughs> no, we don't. We want you to keep going. Now, this type of investment where you get the capital appreciation is a part of what is called the total return. So the total return is the capital appreciation plus the dividends on top. It, and this is the irony of it all, because the businesses nowadays, historically, most businesses would have paid out a dividend. Strong businesses nowadays will try everything they can to grow their business rather than pay out maximum dividend. They'll keep trying different opportunities. 
if you look at something like Alphabet, they keep trying what they call the moonshots. They keep trying for different opportunities for new areas of growth. Most of them don't work out. But that's a gambit the company is taking to try and grow. The way I do value investing, I much prefer businesses that have more relevancy, more power, stronger earnings, three, four years down the road, than something that can pay a dividend. But you say, hey, Michael, but I, I can get a, a three or four percent that's pretty much guaranteed. But after watching this video, you can see that nothing is really guaranteed. And whereas you can buy your investment of, in this case, let's say, Berkshire Hathaway, and you can sell 4% of your holding at the end of each year, just after the 12 months, to qualify for capital gains, long-term capital gains, and you, you can get that 4% as well. And you are still allowing for the business to keep snowballing ahead. So that's something that Buffett actually does recommend. Buffett says, if you're a shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway, one strategy could be you sell 3% of your holding at the end of each year and treat that as a dividend to yourself if you need a steady income stream. So I hope you found this video useful and I'll see you next time.